welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kath Vincent. On the show, Tina Jones shares her inspiring journey to save children's lives. Entrepreneur Mark Ralph gives tips to make it in business. Author Stacey McLean shares the real-life struggle behind her new book. And in the Wild Records music slot with Jesse Wilde, we hear original music from Feelers frontman James Reed. All this and more to wake up your wow. So Tina, welcome. Thanks for being on the show with us. It's wonderful to be here. Now you started the charity Youth in Transition. Tell me, what does Youth in Transition do? So Youth in Transition is a charity that looks after young people yeah. from the age of 10 to 24 who are struggling with anxiety, depression or suicidal ideation. Wow, and, and this is becoming a really common problem, isn't mm. it? It's a huge problem for us in New Zealand. So how did you get started? Well, several years ago I was working with the victim support and police on the suicide bereavement team. Wow. So <clears throat> it was my job to go out to a suicide um, after it had happened and take care of the families. Wow, that would be really hard. It was really hard, yeah. yeah. And my middle daughter, who was 17 at the time, um, had seven of her friends die by suicide in oh. the space of just over a year. So she basically surrounded herself with all these other young people that were struggling yeah. to stay alive, basically, and sort of said, oh, my mum's an expert in this area, come and talk to her. Yeah. So our house at the time was just filled with young people, you know, wanting to be together and wanting help. I mean, sleeping in my bed, that <laughs> I was stepping over them, my husband was in the spare room. It was just, yeah, absolutely manic. So how many children were there? Was, there? Uh, there were at least 30 at the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. So and you literally just threw open the doors? Yeah, we right. had to because there Come was in. such, you know, these kids were hypervigilant, they were scared yeah. around who was going to be next and there was nowhere for them to go because yeah. they weren't you know, unwell enough to go into mental health services and right. in desperate need of help and support. Mm. Yeah. That is a catch-22. If they're not ill enough to go the conventional mm. route, mm. but not well enough to be safe. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, mental health services are absolutely stretched to the limit. Yeah. Many of my colleagues work for them, so I know what it feels like. But yeah, it was. there's a huge need just for these kids to be together and talk about the friends that have died and look at ways of keeping themselves safe. I mean, fortunately, these kids are all doing really well yeah. now. So, um, yeah, it was worth it. Yeah. yeah. How do you define the success that you've had? How do you know what's working and what's not? So basically, the majority of young people that come to us are really in a very broken state yeah. and don't want to be here. So they're literally contemplating suicide? Absolutely. Or may have already attempted suicide. Yeah. So. Um, our success is measured by the amount of young people that are still alive and going on to do amazing things with their lives. Mm -hmm. And also um, they're helping other young people that are coming through the program. So they're mentoring young people. There's nothing better yeah. than you know, a young person telling another how they've managed to get through yeah. some of the darkest times of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Because I imagine that the advice from someone who's been there would mm. be much more powerful. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because there's such a loss of hope. You know, we have amazing therapists and, you know, that we use, but it is holding that hope for young people that's really made a big difference, yeah. yeah. And, mm. and how do you look after yourself in all of this? Because this must be pretty, pretty challenging work. Mm. Yeah. That's a good question because um, we have an amazing community of support up on the Hibiscus Coast. So we have women that cook for us, we have you know, people that offer massage and all these wonderful wow. well-being things. So yeah. it is important, but I think when I sit with a young person that maybe two or three years ago 
was you know thinking of checking out to seeing what they're doing now and to see the way they come back yeah. that is so inspiring yeah. it's so worth it yeah. so I think it's keeping that perspective you know and knowing that yeah we have made a huge difference yeah. to so many young people's lives and as you say it's not just that one person it's no. their parents and their Absolutely. family and their father yeah yeah so where to from now for you well, we've seen the charity grow at a huge rate recently. I mean, I'd like to make us redundant, but I think, um, you know, for the moment, there is a huge need um, for anybody that's tried to get a young person into mental health services. They will know the struggle that that is, and there's so, so much lack of resources. So I think for us, I mean, we've, we've actually pulled together a huge amount of people on our journey that have helped us to help these young people. It's been amazing yeah. to just see the support that has come out. Yeah. Mm. And when you look back to the start, if you had some advice for your former self, what would it be? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it, no. Um, I don't know, really. I mean, it's just, it's been a labour of love. Yeah. I've never regretted <clears throat> a moment of it. Yeah. You know, and it's just been something we dipped our toes in, and here we are years later. You know, knowing that we've helped so many people. And there's mm. plenty of people who, you know, they want to do stuff in the world, but, you know, uh, maybe someone else will do it. Mm. What would you say to those people? Well, I, I think we hear that all the time because it's pretty scary being around some of these young people who don't want to be here. Yeah. But I would say jump in and do it because, you know, the difference that it makes, even if you've just got a skill. Yeah. I mean, I know some people that have come on board to help me take care of myself. You know, that in turn is helping me to help, you know, young people. Yeah. Furthermore, the young people just feel so connected and valued and often that's all it takes. Yeah. 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 Mm. Well, Tina, you're doing an awesome job. Thanks so much for joining us on Thank the show. Thank you. Up next, Mark Ralph on business success. For joining me here today. My question to you is, how confident are you when you speak in public? How confident would you be doing an elevator pitch like this one? Okay. The truth is, if you are not supremely confident every time you speak, you're not the best ambassador for your business. Right. You're not the one who's going to get that job promotion. And you're simply not the person you were born to be. Get happy when you speak and you'll discover confidence you never knew you had. And those results will show up everywhere. Mark, welcome. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks, Kath. Now, listen, you founded a company called TimberTech some time ago. Tell me, what does TimberTech do? TimberTech washes, protects, and maintains cedar properties. Yeah. It's not the most exciting job in the world, <laughs> but really I've been doing not. it for 25 years now, and I love it. So where did you get started? Like, how does a person get started in business? Where did you start? Well, I started very early. I remember my first foray was when I was nine. Oh, wow. And it was at the local pet shop. And I used to work there on a Saturday morning, and we had a local sawmill that used to bring in these great big bags of sawdust. They were literally, I was only nine, so they seemed huge. They're yeah. probably about six. <laughs> <weight>. yeah. <laughs> I, probably, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't a tall nine either. <laughs> but these bags seemed massive. And my job was to go in there on a Saturday morning and then break them down into smaller bags yeah. so you could then sell them to people for pet, you know, for their own, for their hamsters and rabbits and, yeah. and everything else. Okay. So, so that was when you were nine. And yes. You, and you've yeah. done a bunch of different things, like an entrepreneurial spirit, you know. And I didn't realise I was. You know, it wasn't until I got later in life and realised that I'd been an entrepreneur my whole life. I've yeah. never had a job for more than 18 months. Wow. And that was when I arrived in New Zealand back in 91. I worked for 18 months for the warehouse over here. Yeah. And that was my longest ever career yeah. whilst working for somebody else. Other than that, I'd worked for myself since I was nine years old. So why did you keep creating things? You've done a heap of stuff. Like, you've had a million lifetimes, haven't you? Yeah. I love shiny objects. <laughs> like, there's always something that, yeah. And it doesn't matter what it is. And I'll be in a conversation with somebody. They'll say something. 
I'll hear an opportunity and the next thing we're having a conversation about how that could look. Yeah. And a lot of those things I've got excited about myself. So whilst managing and running Timber Tech for the last 25 years, it's really allowed me to go and play in many other different fields as well with different people yeah. in different enterprises. Yeah. Mm. So do you think that creativity has served you well? Some people will be shiny objects and it means literally that they can't conclude anything. Yeah. I'm careful because what I used to do was very much that, unfinished projects everywhere. Yeah. But I got to a point where I realised that that wasn't ever going to get me anywhere. Yeah. If I were coaching somebody else, I'd say the first thing you need to do is finish that project. Yeah. Yet there I was with these unfinished projects myself. Yeah. So I've surrounded myself with really great people. Yeah. And that's been the key. Right, okay, so great people, that's an important... Mm. Yeah. It's probably, the, for me, the most important. Finding people that, that love doing what I don't like doing and then I can do what they don't like doing, which is what I enjoy doing. And often the, the talking to people, I'm not good at crossing T's and dotting I's. It's not a natural way of being for me. So it's something that I've disciplined myself over the years. Mm -hmm. But if I can find somebody who likes crossing T's and dotting I's, then great, there's, there's the opportunity for a great partnership. Yeah, so actually one of, the, one of the foundations of business will be to find the right people to support you. Critical, okay. yeah, critical aspect for me. So it hasn't all been roses your entire business career, has it? No, 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 and, and I think that's part of what makes where I'm at now as, as fun or as exciting as it has. I've, I, about 11 years ago, the GFC literally nearly wiped me out. Yeah. I was that close to being bankrupt working really closely with the banks, with the IID, to yeah. try and manage myself through that process. Yeah, so the global financial crisis basically hit a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. And I was not well set up. One of the things I hadn't done well 12 years ago was, was set the businesses up in a way where they were separate and distinct from me. So right. my business and my, all my family and everything was all intertwined and had been that way forever. Yeah, all the eggs in one basket. Literally, yeah. yeah. So when one, yeah, and it was that domino effect. and. You know, I look back on that now and it was a very valuable and costly exercise, yeah. but really did set me up nicely for where we're at right now. Yeah. What did you learn from it? The critical aspect for me was putting in the systems and processes to make sure that the businesses themselves yeah. were looked after. Yeah. Whereas before I had myself been looked after by the business, now the business itself exists as its own entity. So yeah. I look after the business it's, and then the business takes care of me rather yeah. than me first. Yeah, that actually would be very common. A lot of people start in their own business and it's just them. Yeah. It's just I am the business and the business is me. Especially in New Zealand. Yeah. So many small to medium sized businesses in New Zealand and where we exist here is like when we work we get paid, when we don't work we don't get paid but we still think we're in a business. Yes. And that was how it was for me. I worked very hard, I earned good money. When I wasn't working I didn't earn any money. Yeah. Now having a business, people all work in the business. And so if I'm not working, the business is still operating yeah. and is still making money without needing me. Yeah. So how did you move past that global financial crisis stage? Well, we literally had to start again. Wow. So my business partner and I, or my colleague, we were working together there. We were out knocking on doors in the evenings to try and generate work for the following day. Wow. So you, you literally, you mean literally, I'm out there, I'm knocking on the doors, I'm trying to generate the business. Yep. So plenty of people would be not willing to do that. Yeah, and many weren't. We had, there were 12 of us working in the business when it came through. We had 10 franchises throughout the country yeah. and only two of them survived. Yeah. The others just weren't willing to do, to go right back to the basics, which was you know, yeah. asking for the work. Yeah, and I guess there's something in there. You know, if you're trying to extract the principles of what make businesses successful, what, what do you think makes a person successful in business? Well, sticking to your knitting. Yeah. One of the things is getting clear on why you're doing what you're doing and then doing it to the best of your ability. Sticking to your knitting. Yeah, I got that from a du an old Dutch guy, Eddie, uh, from Dad's Pies, very successful um, businessman. And I met with him probably 20 years ago and it was one of the things that stayed with me. Yeah. He said, like, literally, because making pies, I mean, how much, how hard can that be? Except this guy now is, you know, doing pies all over the world. And yeah. I thought, yeah, I like that. And he said, stick to your knitting. And I, I got the concept of doing what you do really, really well. So, and we do, and Timber Tech is now, it, throughout the country, will be the leading experts in timber restoration and refurbishment. Yeah. Not as exciting as pies, <laughs> I'm sure, but you know, <laughs> along the same vein. But more slimming. That's what we, what we, yeah, probably, yeah. And then the second thing I think is working in teams. One of my passions is football, yeah. soccer, as yeah. you call it here, but football. Yeah. And, and I do liken the two things, working with people who, they turn up early, for work or they, they stay later. The same deal applies at football. You know, the guys that turn up early help carry the stuff out. They work hard, they train hard, they play hard. And then afterwards you can socialize with them. That's been the, the most of the people that work with me 
One of the, my colleagues has been 20 years, 117, 112. When you find the people that you work well with, then you keep them around you yeah. and, and, and everybody wins. So Mark, if you had one final tip for us on being successful in business, what would it be? It's got to be about football. <laughs> So, no, it's about business. It's about football. <laughs> it's always about, it always comes back to football. You know, you walk over the line and for 90 minutes, yeah. you literally give it everything you've got. And I think the same applies to business. You play like your life depends upon it. Oh, I love that. Mm. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thanks, Kat. Up next, Stacey McLean on Overcoming Excuses. Stacey, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm really excited about your new book. This is your third book, right? Yes. Okay. And the title is I Would Love To But. Yes. So where did that come from? The title came from um, what people would say to me a lot. Um, no matter when I was doing things like when I dyed my hair or was running marathons or traveling, people would always say to me, I'd love to do that, but. Why do we all say that? Why do we have excuses for the things we want to do? Yeah. So it would always come with all these lists of excuses that they'd have, like, I haven't got the time the money, I can't do that, I don't want to do it alone. All these different excuses have come through. So I looked at 10 of the main excuses uh, that I heard most often. Yeah. And I looked at my friends who were the people that were going out doing stuff and looked at what were the differences uh -huh. between that. And I saw that the friends that I had that went out and did stuff, they had the same issues but they just saw them as ex ob obstacles to overcome rather than excuses to stop them doing what they wanted to do. Right, so when yeah. you assess those different groups of people, they face the same stuff, yeah. but just deal with it differently. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And so how do you get past, you know, you hear those excuses in your own head, oh, I'd love to, but how do you get past those kind of obstacles? Well, I think even just changing them into obstacles rather than an excuse, yeah. because when you look at it as an excuse, you see it as a reason um, why you can't do something. But if you change it into an obstacle, it, you then have power over it. Mm -hmm. And I think it turns your brain to start thinking of ways to overcome it yeah. rather than just cutting it off. Uh -huh. So if you change it into an obstacle, then you can find ways to overcome it. Great. And so tell me, you haven't had the easiest road in the world. You know, people might say, oh, well, it's easy for you, but, yeah. um, but you've had a challenging time. Yeah, yeah. So I um, kind of had a difficult childhood and when I was 14 I became an alcoholic wow. and um, started drinking quite heavily and I spent 10 years uh, drinking and chasing alcohol to solve all my problems. Wow. And I got to a really desperate place um, and I came through that, um, through coming to faith and uh, becoming a Christian and that road to emotional healing. And through that I had to learn to overcome all these excuses. I've used these all myself. Yeah. So then I could um, explain how I went through them and yeah. came out the other side. So this book is really written from the heart, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So give me an idea of what to expect in the book. Sure. So one of the excuses I look at is this excuse of I just can't do that. Yeah. Um, sometimes you look at things and think, oh, I just can't do that. Yeah. Well, and you just stop. Me. You yeah, just stop in your tracks. You. Yeah. yeah. So um, for an example, when I was um, 12 years old, I had a teacher that I really loved at Intermediate and she was an aerobics instructor in the evening. So she had this um, competition in class that if whoever won the competition would get to go to her class in the evening. Ooh. So um, I, me and my friend really tried hard and we won this competition and we got to go to this aerobics class in the evenings. And it was in the 80s, there was a lot of lycra, kind Leg of fluoro, yeah, <laughs> levels, a lot of fluoro colours. But I just loved that. I walked into that class, there was so much energy and um, just the colour and the music and I just fell in love with that. And I saw those instructors and I thought, I want to do that, I would love to do that. But, um, and even as a 12 year old, I thought, I don't look like those ladies. I, you know, I can't do this as a job, this is just crazy. I will never be able to get up on stage and, and dance in front of people or encourage people or be in, energetic like that. So I just cut it off and put it away. And it wasn't until I got into my 40s that um, I went back to a dance class. Um, I'd been running and I didn't uh, needed something, something more fun to do. Yeah. Um, so I went back to a dance fitness class and I started at the back of the class um, and, and trying to hide from everyone. And then I slowly moved my way to the front of the class and had an amazing instructor and eventually ended up on stage. Wow. And then when the opportunity, uh, when they started Easy Moves Dance Fitness, I was given the opportunity to train as an instructor and I trained as an instructor and now I run my own class on a Monday morning oh, wow. and I am an aerobics instructor, a dance fitness instructor now and because I could do it all along 
It was just yeah. that the time I thought, I can't do that. Yeah, and you know, that's an interesting point that you make. You know, you can do it all along. All yeah. the things that you think, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. Maybe you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What else stops people, do you think? I think the big ones are time and money. Yeah. And they're probably the ones they hear the most. Um, and are they real though? You know, people say, well, look, I don't have the money or I don't have the time. Is yeah. that an excuse or is that a fact? Well, I think we're very busy now. Um, but when you look at your lifestyle, I think um, you, you can usually find an hour or two in a day. And one of the things in the tips I give in the book is the idea of, you know, if you had a 40 hour week to work on your dream yep. once a year, imagine how much you could get done. Oh, wow. If I just gave you a week off and you could go and work on your dream. But the, that's the same as spending just one hour a week over the course of a year. So if you can, anyone can find one hour a week. Yeah. You get up early or go to bed later or watch less Netflix for one day. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one hour, less, one hour less on Facebook. Do that and spend that working on something you want to do, whether it's a night class or whatever it is, writing a book or whatever. Yeah. And over a course of a year, that's 52 hours. Yeah. And you can make a huge dent in it. So yeah. it's just even these small little changes you can make to your life that can have a big impact. Yeah. So what's next for you? Um, the, well, the book is just coming out. Um, it's coming out now. And um, so a lot more speaking um, around that and promoting the book. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure there's another couple of books in the works. On yeah, yes. Yeah. So when you wrote your first book, was that a I'd love to, but... Yeah, definitely. Oh. Yeah, there was <laughs> I something. felt that you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there was. It was definitely something I sat on for a very, very long time. And um, it was because it was more my personal story of um, the drinking and coming through that and getting sober. It was a, um, a very long process because yeah. I had to work through a lot of my own kind of issues and feelings and stuff through that. Yeah. Um, but again, it was, you know, it, it was once I'd done it and put it out there, it was a great experience. Yeah. And that's one of the things of when you think about the things you, I would love to, it's not always just about seeking pleasure and things that feel good, but sometimes even doing the hard things, the things that take a lot of hard work or really scary, yeah. um, like standing on stage or anything that you might find is scary, those are the things that help you grow and um, become a better person and give you so much joy in the long term. Well, thanks for yeah. capturing all of that in the book. I wish you every success with it. Thank you. Jessie Wilde, hello, welcome Great. back. How's it going? <laughs> Good love. So tell me, I'm super excited, who is recording on the show today? Oh, we've got a mega star today. We have? Yep, so um, I play with a guy named Ed Taylor down at uh, Lumsden Freehouse. Of course, we know Ed. Yeah. And so we're performing as Wild Taylor in this bar and who is in the audience but none other than the famous James Reed. Are you serious? James Reed from The Feelers? Yep. How and cool is that? It was for, and even cooler, he got up and sang a song with us. Neat. So I invited him on the show and he's here today. Awesome, well let's hear from James. Let's do it. Another night on planet nowhere Another night drawn full of stars Tell my friends we'll all be leaving Gonna blast out of this rock But they do not believe me No, they do not believe it's a great open space I've been floating in this field I can't recognize my face I've been drowning in my fears And I've been laying it to waste And there's no more second chances here Gonna turn the ship around I'm gonna take my team home I've been drowning in my fears 
I've been laying it to waste There's no more second chances here Gonna turn the ship around Gonna say nothing home You know I never thought it would be this hard I think I miss my heart too Yeah, I know it would be this hard I think about the falling rain When I never see it on your face again Cause it's a great open space Been floating in this fear I can't recognize my face I've been drowning There's no more second chances here Gonna turn the ship around I'm gonna take my team home Yeah, there's no more second chances here Gonna turn the ship around And take my team home Second chances here Gonna turn the ship around Take my team home Thank you, James. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. I love that song. Is it, so this is a new song? This is. This is a new one called Planet Nowhere. Yeah, and why did you write it? Oh, that's a good question. We were sort of briefly talking about the um, idea of being slightly lost uh, either emotionally or out in space and the idea of sort of gathering your thoughts and you know bringing your team home or whatever and sort of uh, getting focused again I think yeah. you know getting a little homesick and going yeah a little bit crazy a little bit lost yeah I've been there <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. that's a, great, yeah. a great metaphor yeah I mean it's, sometimes you do have to bring it home you know you get lost out and you, everything goes crazy and bringing it back to back to your roots maybe well, not only that, I think we can get confused with um, with everything that we read and, and watch on the with the media, and, and you know, there's, we get bombarded with information on the internet and stuff nowadays. And yeah. it's a question of you know, what do you believe? You know, how much of it is real and all that sort of stuff. But that's got nothing to do with the song in particular. <laughs> 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 it's just <laughs> dealing with the overwhelm, maybe. Basically, it's just a whole over, <laughs> overwhelming thing, like yeah. you say. Yeah. Very nice. And you're going on tour soon, aren't you? Uh, yes. Um, so this isn't September. with the feelers, this is a solo tour as well? Yes, this will just be solo. Awesome. Just uh, myself and, and my acoustic. Perfect. Yeah. Just playing um, some new stuff and old stuff and just a few songs that I particularly like from people I've admired along the years. Oh, so, so you can so do some covers and I'll do some covers as well. Brilliant. Love yeah. it. Great. So where can we get tickets for this uh, tour? From Ticketek. And um, you're going north and south, right? Uh, all the way from Whangarei and Invercargill. Brilliant. So, and everywhere in between. Wow, the whole stretch in New Zealand. That's awesome. That's great. And where's the Auckland show going to be? At the Churning Fork. Great. Well, we'll definitely be there. Yeah, uh, we'll um, be there for sure. And thank you for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. My thanks to all my special guests. To Tina, to Mark, to Stacy, to James, and of course, our very own Jesse Wilde. And until next time, don't wait to wake up your wow. Great, that's Thank awesome. You. That's just around the corner, so we'll definitely be there in any case. Nice. Actually, yeah. sorry, that sounded like I was only going because it was around the corner. <laughs> <laughs>